Okay, so um, yeah, the talk I will uh, uh, do today is about uh, work I've been doing in my lab for the last, well, 10 years. And I, I try to provide um, an emphasis on the latest tools we developed, but um, I'll show you also an, a lot of potential there is in, um, in RNA structure field and uh, uh, how we can really use RNA structure to improve the accuracy of our current tools. So um, as an overview of my talk, um, and this is basically the, the, what all this talk will be about, um, there's an important concept that we, we are using in uh, our lab now that is called the Augmented Base Pair Interaction Network. And it's basically based on the idea that uh, in an RNA, you have a base pairing interaction, as everyone knows here. Um, and, but usually we always think about the Watson Creek and Wubble base pair. And that's true, they're very important. They represent about 70% of the interaction, but actually 30%-ish of the other interaction, base pair interaction are, are non-canonical. And um, that means there's a lot of interaction that are not accounted in a regular secondary structure. And the purpose of this talk is really to show how we can uh, use this information to uh, accelerate and improve the current tools uh, using structure, like tools for predicting the structure of RNAs uh, 2D and, and uh, 3D, but also uh, to doing small molecule uh, binding prediction and uh, eventually try to make a better analysis of the structure uh, that we have in databases to help us better understanding evolutionary processes. So the outline of this talk uh, is break as follow. First, we, I will introduce the, the basic concept, the one that's important to understand the, uh, the, um, the following and the techniques we develop. And then I will present the four different tools, uh, all implemented by a uh, student over the years, uh, talented student that, um, that uh, address different aspects, different use we can make of this information to uh, give us better insight about area structures. So the, the first part of this talk is uh, about, so I said RNA structure and what actually this non-canonical base pair interaction I was mentioning earlier. So uh, ultimately what is interesting for us is what you have on left here, this is a tertiary, so this 3D structure of your RNA. This is the one that is um, used to, to carry the function and, like, and at which level we ultimately want to, to rely upon to uh, understand what's going on at the, at the structural level. And um, if you look at this structure, I mean, it's, as you see, it's a very complex structure. There's a lot of details. Uh, it can, it's very um, uh, fine grain um, object. Uh, but what is interesting is like, if you, uh, if you look at this structure, you can extract the interaction that you have between the base pair. Uh, so the canonical base pair we call, so the Watson Creek uh, like in DNA, so like it's a CG, uh, GT, AU, UA, but also the, the Wubble base pairs that so create uh, bonds between the base pair and stabilize the, stru the structure overall. So they really provide um, uh, a scaffold for, for the folding of the, of the, um, of the tertiary structure. Um, so you have an example here on the, on, the, on the right. And what is remarkable, from a computational perspective here, is like if you extract all these, um, these base pair that forms a graph as shown here, and it turns out that uh, most of this, um, this, this graph is mostly planar. So it comes with a lot of nice property that makes design uh, a very efficient algorithm um, for when we focus on predicting the secondary structure. So this secondary structure is important because uh, we know that it falls very quickly and then provide a scaffold for the uh, later on the, the folding of the RNA into its tertiary and the functional structure. And uh, as such, because it really is the base of, of the structure, uh, what we observe in, uh, in many non-coding RNAs um, is that the RNA structure is highly conserved. That's really one of the finding uh, I mean, main observation that we have in a database like RFAM that basically are collecting uh, RNA uh, alignment and they are based on structure. And uh, what we see is like the sequence vary, can vary a lot, but the structure is very strongly conserved. And uh, this is uh, shown here, what you see on the left, you have this uh, alignment and the arcs represent the, the, the conserved base pair in the structure. 
Um, so this is a, I mean, this is a still ongoing field, very tricky. So uh, assessing where the, 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 the alignment is very significant is a, is a real endeavor by itself. I, I invite you actually, to, just for the side story here, to look at software like Airscape that, are very, that so recently software um, a developed software that really help us a lot to, to better understand what is really conserved in the structure of the RNA, which is not as straightforward as, as we might think at the beginning. So based on this secondary structure, many tools have been developed. Uh, well, first databases, uh, like the one I showed before, we have sequence alignment and we see that homologous uh, sequences uh, share the same structure and we use it to build the alignment. And after you have a lot of tools developed by, well, notably the, uh, the, Vienna, the Vienna group um, with the Vienna RNA package or um, in US with uh, they might use developing RNA structure that at, you take a sequence and you pred predict the secondary structure. And, and based on that, after, based on this prediction, this secondary structure, you can do many other things like use it to detect uh, non-coding RNAs uh, or even try to use it, this structure to predict uh, interaction with other molecules. It can be protein, it can be uh, small molecules, and so on and so forth. So um, just the point here is to like the secondary structures as we know it um, has been the basis for a lot of tools that we use nowadays to, to analyze and understand uh, RNAs. But as I was mentioning earlier, well, uh, it turns out that uh, this uh, Swatson Creek and uh, Wubble base pair that are representing about, uh, I would say, 70% of the base pair we found in the, in the RNA structure. Um, so it's not all the interaction. We have actually 30% of interaction that do not fall into this category of what we call here a canonical base pairs. 30% um, basically involve uh, our base pairing between, uh, pairing between two bases but uh, in different ways. And there is a very important work that was done by uh, Leontis and Vestov uh, in the last, uh, in 2000 and even earlier, uh, that consisted in to try to classify these interactions and try to provide us a vocabulary to uh, better represent the, the 3D structures. And what you see here on the left is you have a nuclear base and actually that you have, we see, three edges, the Uxtin edge, the Watson Creek edge, and the Sugar edge. And, and uh, most of the time, the, the, or the Watson Creek base pair, basically they're interacting by this Watson Creek edge in a cis way. But in fact, uh, the, the RNA, the, the, the base can really take up to 12 different, um, different configurations when they're creating these pairings. You may have the, the Watson Creek base pairing with Watson Creek, but sometimes it can be Watson Creek, the Uxtin, or uh, the Sugar edge with the with the Watson Creek or uh, two sugar edge together and so on and so forth. So you see that up to 20, 12, sorry, uh, different ways of interacting here. And um, this gives us basically um, uh, a catalog of structure that we can use afterward to enrich the annotation of the uh, base pairing network in RNAs. So um, this concept that we call here an augmented base pair network uh, that's a term we come up with. You may have seen different uh, ones in literature eventually, uh, but that's the one I'll be using here. Uh, to show you basically how important it can be an RNA. So uh, here you have a circular plot of an RNA. So you have basically the backbone is, the, is the, the, the black line, the black circle there, and the arcs are representing the base pair. And the all here are the canonical base pairs. So what's on, e, what's on Creek and Wubble. But now uh, if you, uh, map on that also all these non-canonical base pair uh, that represent the other type of information, then very, just visually here, you understand that uh, something very important was missing in the previous picture. And um, this information uh, really enriched the, the network and, and hopefully in the end will give us a better um, uh, model for understanding the RNA structure. And this is on the, on the right here, you have basically the same type of representation, but we, we show it uh, with the, on the graphical representation. So RNA as a graph and not the circular plot, but that's the same idea. Furthermore, what, can be, what is interesting to, to note as well 
is that um, most of these non-mechanical uh, base pairs are often uh, concentrated into the loop region of the RNA. So here I'm speaking about the alpine loops, the internal loops, uh, the junctions. Uh, well, first, because these are the unpaired region of the, um, of the secondary structure. So these are the one that uh, we'll, we'll be using to uh, make the prediction. And, um, and this observation led us to uh, uh, another concept that we call the RNA uh, 3D motif that basically said, that, well, what we can do is to extract this, this loop region and, uh, and, and, and extract with it the augmented base pair network that is embedded within the loop or the, uh, the RPNs or the internal loop. And uh, that is a, a motif for us. And why is it interesting? It's because actually it turns out that uh, this network of uh, non canonical base pair is a strong signature for the 3D structure of the structural element. So if you have the same uh, base pair, augmented base pairing network here, we're very likely you will have the same uh, 3D structures. And this is what you, you see here uh, on the right here when it's uh, on the RNA 3D motif at last, um, you see we find the same uh, 3D fragment in many different RNAs, but they all have the same uh, augmented base pairing network. So um, that basically provided the, the background and all the, the material to, um, to, uh, to understand the, 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 the following uh, tool that we have here, we'll, we'll discuss today. And the first talk I, I want to, uh, first work I want to speak about is a work uh, called uh, Carnaval that was done actually by uh, Vladimir Reinhardt, which was here, was uh, now, uh, was st my student before, but now moved, came back to Montreal as a prof at, uh, at UCAM. And uh, Antoine Soulet also grad graduated and now is at, uh, at Mila. So um, what is the first thing you're trying to do? Um, so there are 3 motif databases and, and, and the idea is to uh, try to, to make a catalog of the substructure, uh, the, the fragment that are conserved across RNAs and try to, to classify them. And I, I put their list, so they can be sometime at the level of secondary structure, uh, sometime at the level of the, of the, uh, of the 3D structure, sometimes also the level of the non clinical base pairs I was mentioning. Um, but all of the database mostly are really focusing on, on local motifs. So I mean, really things that are embedded into the up in the loops and uh, or in the junctions. And moreover, um, there's no real um, fully automated method to make automatic discovery of this. I mean, the number of, of structure that we have in database is really augmenting very fast and we need to have tools to uh, help us to identify this motive automatically instead of doing it by hand. So um, most of the time we don't have both uh, parameters criterion uh, together. Um, what we're interested in, actually I was mentioning earlier the, the, the local structure and it's something uh, I, I could have mentioned during the, in the background session here, but uh, I bring it here because that's really specific to this work. Um, so this is the RNA structure, uh, 3D structures of an RNA, and you see that the way it falls in 3D is uh, well, very specific, very complex. But what is important to see here is like at the top, you see two, um, you will see uh, two uh, air pins uh, that are basically, um, well, kissing each other to, uh, to stabilize the, the 3D architectures. And this type of what we call long range interaction is very important to stabilize the 3D fold. And uh, before Carnival, there was no knowledge, no uh, systematic way of analyzing these interactions and try to, uh, to make a catalog of, this, of these motifs with these long range interactions. So um, this type of interaction, you, have, you probably know many of them like the, the A minor or the ribose zipper. And um, our goal was to develop a tool such that we take the, uh, all the 3D structures available in database and we automatically process them to extract uh, these conserved structural motifs. So the way we do this is uh, by, by using this um, uh, augmented base pair, base pair network. 
Of course, we uh, we don't work at the three D level. That's and that's basically what why we're using the the, the augmented uh, base pairing network here. So what you see on the left and the right here are, are two different RNAs uh, that are annotated with canonical and non canonical interactions. And uh, what we're interested in here is try to extract to find what these two things have in common and try to extract motifs that are shared by these two structures. Um, and, and furthermore, motifs that are shared by these two structures, two structures, but that also have this long range interaction. These are the one that you see in red here on both diagram. And uh, if I go back to the previous slide, that basically the type of interaction you see here that's the key thing up in the one stabilizing the threefold of this molecule. So how do we do this? Well, first we, we decompose this, um, these structures into uh, secondary structure elements. So that give us bricks, different uh, smaller blocks that we can compare. And um, afterward, what we want to do is try to compare them, uh, all pairs of this element, to try to find what they have in common. And here, because we're interested in finding motifs that, that uh, include these long range interactions, of course, here we want to compare both. But if you look at these two st uh, structure loops here, uh, two kissing alpines, uh, well, it is obvious that they're not uh, exactly the same. They're, they're, they, are, they have um, uh, similarities, but not strictly equivalent. And what we want to extract from that is really uh, a maximal uh, subisomorphism between the two. And uh, so I won't go into the technical detail of this. Um, that's a pretty long uh, discussion. And the, uh, we had several methods developed for doing this job faster and faster. Um, but uh, the idea is we try to take these two graphs and try to ex extract what they have in common. And um, the first thing we did it was basically by uh, trying to first capture the long range interaction and try to grow the network around this. And, um, and that's basically the, the basic techniques we've been using so far. And that worked quite well. And, and using this, this approach, basically you can extract these two networks here that, are, that basically are uh, shared patterns between the two motifs. And uh, what it tells us is that it's a pattern that is conserved in between RNA structures. So uh, that's potentially something interesting to look at because it could be ultimately something that is uh, conserved uh, through evolution. But we're not there yet, but that's uh, what we want to do ultimately. So what we did was uh, implementing this approach to, uh, to mine all the PDB structures and we call this pipeline carnival. And uh, so that's, you see, you have now the idea what we did. We take the PDB structures, we extract the secondary structures, actually the augmented uh, base pair. And uh, we make a loop decomposition and we extract all, all, um, all uh, secondary structure element. We compare them and we extract all the recurrent motif that we store in a database that we call Carnaval. And Carnaval is available on the website here, carnaval.lre.fr, um, because it's a work that we're doing with Alain Denis at, um, at the University of Paris Sud. And uh, to the first version, basically, uh, we process 800, a bit more than 800 uh, RNAs. Uh, there was uh, 1,500 loops, and um, we found a couple of several hundred uh, conserved substructures and of course, many more instances because uh, uh, each uh, concept substructures may have uh, different origins. Um, we have a kind of a two version, there's a bioarchive paper already uh, available. Basically, it's a, it's a much faster extraction that enable us to really uh, go much deeper into the analysis of these interactions. Uh, there was limitation in, in Carnival 1 that was mostly on the, uh, on the time required to process everything. It took months to to do this, but uh, in the end, that um, we'd be able to to uh, in, in improve the process to make this in couple of in terms of hours instead of uh, of weeks. And what we collect is something like this. So uh, don't worry, I won't go into detail. Uh, that may be a bit too tedious. But typically, what you can do in kind of our website is you can have access to uh, different tools. So if you can look, look for your favorite structure or just explore the, the trees of uh, different motif, uh, recurrent motif that we find here. And when you click on one of them, you basically see the, the conserved motif that we identified and the 3D structure that were uh, found into the, the RNA. And what is very interesting here, what I, I really want to emphasize is like all the motif that we, we look for, we did all the work at the level of the graph. So the base pairing network. 
But when you try to map that at the 3D level, you see that it's very highly conserved. So using this, uh, this augmented base pair network uh, here is very efficient tools because we have graphs, we, we have very efficient algorithm and graphs that enable us to do a very good job even at the 3D levels. And I think that's the, if there's one takeaway to take from this is, uh, is probably this. Uh, so what you can find also in this, uh, in, in this kind of a database it's uh, also all this um, uh, look at specific motif. And what was very interesting for us is like, so we have um, a, a DAG, so uh, direct acyclic graph, basically to classify this, where basically uh, a, a motif generated from another one if it's included inside. And um, what we can see here is like basically you see the amino type one and ribose hyper that, that have been found uh, in these two motifs basically can be merged in another conserved motif that we found here in between. So potentially uh, the exploration analysis of this, uh, of this uh, network uh, will help us to better understand some evolutionary processes. Um, I won't claim we have done it here, but that's really what we want to do uh, with uh, Alain Denise and Vladimir and Raz and, and uh, Jan Pontis, so collaborators in this project. So um, what we showed with Carnaval was really um, that we can take the, the 3D structures and extract these recurrent motifs. But now the, the goal is, uh, well, now that we know what these motifs are, can we use it to make good structure prediction? And that's uh, what we're trying to do here with the base pairing network that uh, is a project that is developed by Romain Sarazin Gendron with a, that you may have speak with at the poster 750. Um, and, uh, and basically Roman uh, implemented this base pairing network. Uh, we had two version of it and the last one just appeared last, uh, last month at Recomb. And uh, that's what I will mainly speak about today. So what's the objective of the of, uh, base pairing? Well, the idea is to say that uh, we start from an input sequence. So that's the only thing we have. Well, we have an input sequence and we have a database, uh, a collection of, mo of uh, motifs, the one I was mentioning earlier. So, um, what we have actually is it's a graph like this with preferences for different nucleotides at different nodes of this network. And what we want to do is to, uh, to scan the sequence to try to find the best match uh, for uh, this motif here into that sequence. And when you find the best match, basically what that allows you is to say that I can try to predict the, if these uh, specific 3D motifs occurs in that, in that sequence. So it's a pretty, it's a local motif prediction tools. So um, what uh, now just to try to explain a bit the, the database we have here. So um, we have this motif, this uh, recurrent motif that we collected with method like uh, Carnaval explained earlier, earlier, but potentially other, other method. And um, so what we, ha we have been able to do actually is to find occurrences of uh, the same uh, augmented base pairing, uh, base pair network graph uh, in different RNAs. So what we have is that the same graph, but different sequences. And that's what we collect ultimately with, uh, the, with the, the, the Carnaval or similar framework. And um, this information is very naturally uh, represented by a, a Bayesian network where uh, the graph represents the dependencies and uh, the, um, uh, to each node, you, you have a conditional probability saying what is the probability of observing this nucleotide knowing its neighbor. Um, so just to make things clear, this uh, representation of motif using um, a Bayesian network does not come from us. It's a prior contribution from uh, uh, Eric Vestov and uh, Jose Cruz. Um, it was a Nature Method paper in 2011. And, um, what we did was we tried to improve this, uh, the usability and the, the, the performance of this approach. So previously I was saying that there was this, uh, this work called RM Detect by uh, Cruz and Vestov, published in 2011. And um, we have also the, the, the JAR 3D, uh, which is another software developed by uh, Craig Ziabol and Al. Uh, in our, in uh, 2015. So, 
the, 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 the difference between the two software was really that uh, they're providing a minimal amount of, um, of functionality. It was very difficult with them. Uh, sorry, it's a bit bad. Very difficult with this um, the framework to um, to use it for for large scale application automatically on, on many uh, software. So um, what we implemented was base pairing two. That basically the method to to make it more uh, usable, faster, and um, and build a, a better database. So. Um, So what you have first, like what we did is like we, we took the RNA modules, we uh, extracted the base pairing graphs. We did here a 3D composition to enable us to process more efficiently the dependency when we, be, we are training this Bayesian network. And once at this Bayesian network, we are trying to see where they can fit into the input sequence that we are giving to base pairing two. And uh, to improve the search, to make it more accurate, what we're doing first is like, well, we use RNA subopt here to uh, sample uh, secondary structures and tell us where potentially the, the, the motif can match and could be also stabilized by the global architecture of the RNA. So once you have this information, you try to, to, uh, to you, you prune the, the landscape, try to see where you can insert the motifs. And uh, if you can insert it, uh, then you will uh, we'll score it with the Bayesian network and we output the best match. So we validate this approach on, um, on, uh, but, but on different databases and uh, with different methods. And uh, I, I briefly go over the, um, over the different uh, tests that we did here. Um, so first we, uh, we checked on the different PDB mod modules. So uh, and we look at if the score we're giving was, was um, trying to, to make a better separation between the true and the false motifs. And uh, this is what you're seeing here. And basically we have an excellent uh, F1 rate and false discovery rate. What was probably more interesting uh, from a biological point of view is trying to, to make cross validation on earth and families. So uh, what we did is like we took an earth and family when we know there's a motif that is conserved, we trained the Bayesian network of it and we use it to predict on the other families. And uh, really see that what was very remarkable here is like, uh, this is pretty consistent and the signal we're able to extract uh, from one family can be really applied to find motif in the other family. That's very encouraging if you want to apply this on, on new sequences. So we compare also uh, base pairing two with, uh, with our previous software base pairing one. Um, uh, basically we use it to, uh, as a baseline for for all predictions. And um, what we see is like, well, we, we just more accurate, that's fortunate when you, you increase the, the version, uh, hopefully you're, you're faster you, and, uh, and more accurate. Um, and we also have similar results uh, when comparison for job 3 d uh, That is a, a tool that is most, mostly here to scoring rather than searching as we're doing. But uh, what was encouraging for us, like even on the data set, we're able to, to perform uh, as well at them and potentially uh, to be more specific, actually. So we have a web server here again, the base pairing, I invite you to go to have a look at it. And it's, you just plug a sequence and it output the motif and the location where you can find them. So uh, after that, once you have all this motif, typically what you want to do is to use this knowledge to be able to predict 3D structures. And that's what the RNA MYP framework that was published actually in ISMB uh, in 2012 uh, is doing. And uh, I will go very fast from this. There was work also done by Vladimir uh, at UCAM, but basically what we want to do in this uh, uh, RNMYP was say that, well, now we have some um, uh, motif predicted. Uh, we have many predictions of this motif. We don't know which one are wrong, which one are bad. And at the same time, we can do the same thing with the secondary structures. So we want to blend these two things together to be able to extract what we call a 2.5D uh, structure. That is the secondary structures, but uh, in the loop here, we have a 3D fragment representing the, the, the 3D structures of, of this fragment. And so that's very important because once you add this, well, you can use it to build the 3D structure. And we have tools like the MCSIM tomb developed by, uh, that we use, developed by François Major um, at University of Montreal, uh, that once you have this 2.5D uh, information, 
we can use it to automatically predict the 3D structures. And what we show in the RNMYP that using these tools, we can uh, go much faster and also being much more accurate. Um, so that really provide a, a strong validation for uh, going forward in that direction. And the software is also available here at rnmyp.ca.magil.ca. It was a nice server implemented by uh, Jason Yao lab. Um, and finally, the, the, the last work I want to present today is uh, the work uh, called Air Amigos by um, Carlos Oliver. It's a very recent work just published actually uh, two days ago in uh, Nucleic Acid Research. And it's a very exciting work because it's really uh, started uh, a new era in, in the lab here. Um, so if you want to see Carlos, you can go to poster 751 uh, and you'll be able to answer all your questions on it. So what's the objective of RNAmigos? Well, it's like once we have this uh, uh, augmented base pairing network, can we use it to predict ligand, small molecule ligand to the RNA? So um, here we, we, we assume that here at the beginning that for the, the, the experiment we did and the framework we developed, we assumed that we, we started from the 3D structure of the RNA. So we had the 3D structures and from that we are able to uh, extract the augmented base pairing network. So the network of uh, interaction, including canonical and non-canonical. And uh, we focused particularly to, uh, to the network that was in the vicinity of a ligand that we could find into the, the PDB structure. So you can see here on the left, there's a ligand in purple here and you have all the interaction in, uh, in green and red, and we extract basically this network of uh, non clinical base pair to create this type of graphs. And the goal here was to try to hope that maybe this graph is a good signature for the binding preference of the, the, the molecule inside. So um, here there's, there's two things we did. First is like how to, I show you how to encode the, the, um, the the, the molecular structure, but we also have to encode the, the ligand itself, so the small molecules. And we basically use a very uh, classical concept in the field called molecular fingerprint. It's, a, it's basically, it's a, it's a byte vector where uh, a Boolean value here tells you if you find a, a specific chemical substructure into your ligand. So here, you, if you find this, aromat, this ring here or uh, this oxygen here, uh, then you put it there. And you can compute the, the similarity between two ligands by just computing uh, a Jacquard a metric index between the two uh, vectors. And the RNA-MIGOS uh, pipeline basically is trying to, uh, to, to, to assess if uh, this base pairing network can provide a good uh, signature for the binding of this small molecule. So what we did was, so we extracted the, this augmented base pairing network. We use what we call um, here are so a, a graph uh, convolutional network to, to produce um, node embeddings of the graph. And uh, that's, that's a lot of uh, information. So basically we, we apply some pooling and um, we're trying to find the best correlation between this node embedding and the vector of the ligand that we, we find there. So the, the idea is that you start from the uh, RNA structures and from the, the ligand and the output, uh, once, once in strain, the output of RNA MIGOS will be um, a predicted fingerprint that uh, should represent or should be a good um, representative of the type of molecule that bind this specific uh, augmented uh, base pairing network. So, um, was this, yep. We have uh, four minutes left, including questions. Yeah, that's it. So I'm just finishing. Um, yeah, perfect. Um, so I'll just go very quickly here. So basically, the way we did the, we compute the, um, the we represent in a framework, of course, uh, the graph we had to represent as vectors, and we use here a graph convolutional network to do that job. Um, and uh, when we basically apply our uh, RNA MIGOS to predict different uh, ligand, it was very pleasing for us to see that. Uh, that's what we hope, but at the same time, it was pleasing to see that we are able to achieve a very high um, accuracy here um, of specificity of predicting ligands. So the main experiment we did here was basically um, we, we had a, a ligand, but we also tried to generate many decoys. So uh, other molecules, that are not the true one, the one that should not bind to the, the modules. And we tried to see that if the prediction of RNA goes, how close it was to this uh, target uh, ligand. And so the, the higher rank in this experiment means that you have uh, better predictions. 
And what we see here is like when you compare, uh, so what you, we did with the, the uh, Aaron Imigo's performance, what is on the very left in green here, we see that we have a, almost a 0 0.8 above the 80% um, in, in the ranking. So uh, very high predictions. And it's much better than what you have by just putting random graphs, uh, which is what you see on the right. But what's most important is like by, you see by adding more information, of course, you gain a lot every time. So if you just take into consideration the primary structure, you have something like so-so, but if you add the secondary structure is better, but adding the, the, the non clinical best part information adds a lot re uh, comparatively in terms of magnitude to the, to the accuracy of the prediction. That's a very encouraging from that point of view. Um, so what we see in, uh, uh, furthermore, it did that we have, um, we predict in very different families. I probably I won't have time really to go over this, but uh, what represent here is like, we wanted to see that we're not biased to one, one specific families. So the, uh, the, the cluster, central cluster here is amino glycosid, which is um, a very well-known known to well bind. We predict it very well. And we think it's probably because he has a lot of interaction with the molecules, so easier for us to predict. But still, we're doing quite good on the smaller molecules, and that's uh, also a source of hope for the future. Uh, we did a comparison with n 4 which is another software used only secondary structure uh, to predict it. Um, and we see that, of course, we're better, but I think I don't want to speak too much about it because the, the benchmark is a bit unfair to, to n 4 So we have to, 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 uh, to, to uh, compare to, to really see where we stand but um, we use a uh, different type of information. So um, the only thing that was imp important for us is like what we found, uh, the prediction obtained by Infoena is basically what we have also when we on only use the canonical base pair uh, versus the, the augmented base pair network. So that was um, reassuring for us. So I, I hate to interrupt, but we yeah. are really hitting. Uh, yep, I'm actually one, done now. I just said one, that's a, one minute left. Thank yeah. you. So the RNME goes to now basically is, is available as a website. And that was literally my, my last slide saying that what we, what we show here is like we, we have this um, non canonical uh, uh, base pair uh, interaction catalog that enable us basically to, to, be, to better annotate the, the, the structure. And we have all this suite of tools that basically help us to go from 3D to uh, extract from the 3D the motifs, then from a motif, try the prediction of motif, then from the, the motifs of the structure, being able to predict the 3D structures. And once you have these 3D structures, you see to sort of predict the ligand. And so to thanks all the, um, the, the students that did this and collaborators, uh, well, I invite you to check the list, but it's um, uh, there's many students like Vladimir, uh, Roman, uh, Jason, Nguyen, Carlos, Vincent, Jacques, did a lot of amazing work here. And I'm happy to take questions if I can, otherwise I can answer by email, of course.